next song we introduced last week, and I just wanted to read some of the words in this. There is a promise that points beyond all my failure. There's a still voice to silence my fears. It says, by your stripes I am healed with one touch. I am made whole. Your word is settled in heaven. It will be done. Father, let it be done. What a blessing it is that we can have the confidence that in all situations, in all circumstances, and in the craziness that is our world, that God is greater than all of that. That his will will be done no matter what. We've had a crazy year full of anxiety, full of fear, controversy, and anger, hurt, pain. But God is in control. Again, his will will be done. So let's remain standing together as we proclaim that no matter what comes our way, that God is greater. There is a promise that points beyond all my failure. And there is a still voice to silence all my fears. And even the worst of my mistakes are miracles in the making, a miracles in the making by your strength.
may be seated. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm not nervous at all. Don't worry. <laughs> it's so good to be here with y'all this morning. And I just want to say thank you for just giving this opportunity to preach to you all. I know all y'all family and friends. I think I've eaten and talked to each and every one of you. But it's special, it does a special thing in my heart for you to give me an opportunity to use my gift, <laughs> use my gift, and share God's word with you. Before I get started, uh, I want to talk about somebody who's dear to me. He's kind of dear to me. It would be more moving if he wasn't here, but he actually showed up today. <laughs> Our pastor, Pastor Tim, we have an okay pastor, right? <laughs> well, Pastor Tim has been mentoring me for about a year now, and uh He's made a huge impact on my life. I don't think he realized how much he do for me. Just once a week meeting with me, sharing with me, teaching me things uh, that I felt uh, was in my heart to do. And he's been pulling those things out of me and giving me opportunities to do those. But um, I heard a lot of good sermons. But last sermon, last week, was one of my favorites. And it's not because it, it talked uh, personally to me, but to watch a, a man of God get up here and address, open up the Bible and address an issue that's unpopular, that's toxic, something that he didn't want to do or had to do, but he did it because he has a love for his brothers and sisters in Christ who doesn't look like him. I left here feeling more loved and more unified. So as I grow in the ministry, as I grow in my teaching, I hope that one day I'm, a, I'm as half as brave as he was last Sunday uh, to give such a difficult, difficult sermon. Can we just put our hands together and celebrate our, our pastor? <laughs> well, the good thing is I don't have to talk, address any of those issues because he's already done it. So <laughs> I get to preach about Jesus, amen? <laughs> amen. Um, I want, my sermon is going to be coming from Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43, and um, I'll be reading from the NIV version. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43. And it reads, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are being punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him and said, truly I tell you, today, today you will be with me in paradise. If y'all will for a moment bow your heads with me while I pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for just another day, just another day to come into your church with other fellow Christians and fellowship and practice perfect koinonias, that we can all come together and open up your word and worship you and lift up our hearts and show beautiful expressions of our faith. Well, God, as we study your word together today, open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our perspectives and our wills, 
and let us be receptive to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Okay, I'm just going to get started. <laughs> By show of hand, how many of you all like to read? Okay, put them down. <laughs> I love reading novels, and I know what you're thinking. He's a tad bit old to still be reading fiction, <laughs> and you might be right. But I love reading novels. So um, I want to share with you a book that I read. It's called The Alchemist. It's about a shepherd boy who has a dream and misinterprets it. Um, the story goes, at night, the shepherd boy would herd all of his sheep into an abandoned church, and he would go outside and sleep underneath a sycamore tree, where he would have this dream of an, a, a recurring dream of finding a large treasure. Now, um, those of you who have heard this story or even read this story, you know that that sycamore tree was a very important place in this story. Matter of fact, let me just back up. This whole story reminds me of one of Steve's favorite sayings. <laughs> Steve is an elder here at our church, and um, we do home groups at Steve and his wife's Angie's house. And anytime we're talking about uh, life challenges, I don't even know if he said, uh, remember saying this, but anytime we always talk about life challenges and uh, hard situations and hard times, he will always say, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. I know that I'm exactly where God wants me to be. And I love that last part. I know that I'm exactly where God wants me to be. This would have been great advice for this shepherd boy because underneath that sycamore tree was exactly where God wanted him to be. But for those of you who don't know the story, let me give you the short version. I'm going to do it real quick. He kept having dreams about finding his treasure. So he goes and talks to his friends who convinces him to sell his sheep and move to Egypt to search the pyramids for his treasure. So he sells all his sheep. And as soon as he gets ready to set on his journey, he's robbed. He loses all, all of his money and his possessions, but he doesn't give up. Broken without a dime, he still sets out on his journey. He travels from Spain to Egypt. He travels by boat. He walks through deserts. He uh, goes through war zones. He meets a girl. He falls in love. He gets his heart broken. He finally reaches Egypt to search the pyramids just to be beat up and robbed again. Defeated, he tells somebody about his dream in Egypt. And uh, they tell him that they, too, have been having a recurring dream. And get this. It's about a shepherd boy who's been sleeping on a large buried treasure under a sycamore tree. So he goes to Spain. He finds that abandoned church. He goes out to the sycamore tree. He begins to dig, and he unearths a large buried treasure. This is the part of the story where uh, Steve would say he was exactly where God wanted him to be. <laughs> Amen? I told you that long, drawn-out story. Because the shepherd boy misunderstood the purpose of his dream. And that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly the underlying issue in our text today. Israel misunderstood the purpose of Jesus. There was doubt if Jesus was the Messiah. There was doubt if Jesus was the Christ. And if I was to give my sermon um, a title, it would simply be Making Christ Your Perspective. If you would right now, if you want to, just uh, tweet, uh, Snapchat, uh, put that on Facebook or Instagram, and just tag me in at Making Christ Your Perspective. Making Christ Your Perspective. Or write it down and do a mental picture. It takes it to yourself like me. <laughs> but uh, Making Christ Your Perspective. That's what I want to preach from today. Uh, our text comes from the book of Luke. And by the way, the Gospel of Luke was authored by Dr. Luke, the physician. <laughs> and that's right, Luke was an essential worker, so I think that goes right with our lessons. <laughs> so he was an essential worker. He authored the book of Luke and the sequel, Acts. And I found it so interesting that um, all four Gospels speak or tell the story of Jesus being crucified with these two criminals, but Luke is the only Gospel. Luke is the only one who gives us his insight into the conversation that Jesus had with these two thieves. Now, I want, I want us to look at this scene on the cross. That's why I put it up here. And Brother Tariq, he, he made these and painted these for me. So I appreciate him for that. Um, there's a real compare and contrast going on with these two thieves. Both were criminals, but only one was converted. Both, both made requests of Jesus, but only one was granted. One rejected Jesus as Christ. The other accepted Jesus as Christ. It resulted in, for him in everlasting life. 
I want us to lean in and look, look close to this conversation. The very first statement this thief makes, aren't you the Messiah? Side note, Messiah and Christ are the exact same word with the exact same meaning. Messiah is a translated Hebrew version. Christ is a translated Greek version. Uh, but they both mean the anointed one. So Luke suggests in verse 39 that this thief actually blasphemes God by asking, aren't you the Christ? That very first statement tells us everything we need to know about what was going on during that time frame. And it, it foreshadows to how Israel will ultimately reject Jesus as the Christ. Now, in order for me to make this plain, I need to give you a little history. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's all we need. Oh, Lord, that's all we need is another history lesson on top of this five-hour sermon. <laughs> but, but I'm going to be quick. But it's important, it's imperative that I give you some history so that you can understand why Israel rejected Jesus as a Christ. We can go as far back as the prophets because the prophet Isaiah foretold the coming of Christ 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus. Isaiah told us exactly how Christ would come, that Jesus would be rejected, that Jesus would be crucified. He even mentions Jesus being crucified with these two thieves, at transgressors, as he put it, in Isaiah 53 and 12. Israel had a written profile of who Christ was 700 years prior to them coming, but they still missed God. So why did they miss him? Well, at the time, Israel was under the rule of the Roman Empire. And so they would only focus on those prophecies that said that they, uh, Christ was coming to deliver them or coming to establish a kingdom. They were waiting on a Christ to come deliver them from a foreign government. The whole time missing how Isaiah described Christ as a suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 52 and Isaiah chapter 53. They were so focused on the present circumstance, they missed God. They missed God. I want to show you this. My wife got me this um, neat little camera for my birthday. And she specifically got it so I could be like all the other dads who shows up to their son's Pee Wee Little League games and embarrass the crap out of them <laughs> by videotaping everything that they do. So <laughs> this... Um, Video camera, I like it because it has a neat little fit, uh, feature. It has a zoom button. So as I look in this, I can see everybody in the crowd. Hey, Jody. Hey, Angie. Tony, Joni, how y'all doing? <laughs> uh, so, but as I begin to push the zoom button, I can look all the way in the back and make out Daniel's bald head. <laughs> <laughs> but something interesting happens the more I begin to close up on him. Everybody else in the picture is cut out. And I showed you all that just to make one little point. <laughs> when you focus too closely on the circumstance, you have the tendency to miss everything else. The tendency to miss everything else. Let's look back on this scene on the cross. Now, we already know the end of the story. <laughs> one thief gets saved. The other does it. One grants a request, only one is granted. The first thief blasphemes. He insults God. He's just being sarcastic. Aren't you the Christ? And then he follows it up with, save yourself and save us. I want to tell you the first thief's hang up. His request was only circumstantial. He was only concerned with his current discomfort. He only wanted to be rescued off of that cross when the whole time he was right next to the only man who could grant him everlasting life. I think this is the part of the sermon where Steve would say he was exactly where God wanted him to be. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to meditate on that th throughout the day and throughout the week. Is your perception of Christ based on your circumstance? Is your perception of Christ based off your circumstance? And if you're asking yourself, how do I know that's me? Then ask yourself these series of questions. Do I only pray when things in my life aren't going so well? Do my prayer life looks more like a bucket list or an agenda that I want Jesus to follow when really it should be the other way around? 
we used to follow Christ? Do I get upset when my expectations aren't met from God? Now, now don't misunderstand me because I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray when you have a problem because we serve a God who is specifically concerned about you and your situation. But when you only talk to somebody or speak to someone when you have a problem or you want something, how many know that's not a relationship? That's a situationship. <laughs> My wife taught me a new word. It's called situationship. And I'm pretty sure I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> it's situationship. She says it's an urban word that means a relationship based off convenience or short-term circumstances. And this thief was only looking for a situationship. He only wanted to be rescued off that cross. And when Jesus was only wanting to save his soul, those who look for a Christ only when they have a situation is only looking to make it from the next dilemma or the next crisis or the next pr uh, problem. Listen, Jesus is not your sugar daddy. Amen? <laughs> he is not some genie in a bottle that's going to hear to grant our every request. But Jesus is the very answer to the rest of your life. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the light. And this second, the first thief missed it. He, he only wanted to be saved from the cross when Jesus only wanted to save his soul. And the same thing happened here with Israel. They were so focused on this circumstance, they missed God. You know what? Am I the only one? I want to share something with you. When all this COVID-19, when the pandemic first broke out, I want to know, am I the only one who binge watched the news? Anybody? Any spare moment I had, I was watching the news. I was trying to track the corona. Where did it been? Where did it last gone? Who had it? Who didn't have it? Was it knocking on my front door? I just wanted to know. I was searching any news outlet to figure out anything about uh, the coronavirus. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just saying I'm guilty of it. But one evening, I was watching the news. And there was this government official, he was on, on the news, he was giving his usual daily update. And um, on this particular day, I couldn't focus on anything he was saying. Because at the bottom of the screen, the news channel was displaying the stock market numbers. And they were plummeting. I never seen them fall so low so quickly. And I couldn't concentrate on anything he was saying. Because in the back of my mind, all I could think is somewhere somebody's taking some pretty big hits on their 401k. Somewhere, somebody's losing a job. Somewhere, a business is closing down. By the time he got done giving his, his update, I couldn't tell you anything that had been said. If there was any vital information, I missed it. <laughs> if there was any a cure in the works, I missed it. Because I was so focused on the stock market numbers at the bottom of the screen, I missed the entire speech. Listen, people of God, sometimes we can get so bogged down with our own problems. Sometimes we can let uh, issues in the news get us so worked up. Sometimes we can get so stressed out with uh, situations at work or just any obstacle that presents itself in front of us, and we miss it. Listen, sometimes we ask God for a better circumstance when what we really need is a better perspective. Can I say that again? It sounds like a tweetable for Daniel. Sometimes we ask God for a better circumstance when what we really need is a better perspective. Can I give you some perspective with this scene on the cross? Let's look at the second thief. Now, he's committed the same crime. He's receiving the same punishment. He has the same access to Jesus as the first thief. Look what he says in verse 40. He says, don't you fear God. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a declaration of faith. The second thief says to the first thief, don't you fear God? By making this statement, we know that he has put his trust in Jesus. And this rebuke is really an expression of faith. And watch this. He then owns up to his mistakes. 
in verse 41, he says, we are being punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. Then he goes on to say in verse 42, remember me when you get to your kingdom. He says that to Jesus, remember me when you get to your kingdom. Wow, a light bulb should be going off over each one of your heads today. You know why? Because this thief gets it. He understands the purpose of Jesus. Did anybody catch it? Anybody? Anybody see it? <laughs> well, let me give you a little Christian theology one-on-one in like three seconds. Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Now he is seated on the right hand of God. Because God is a just God and we are sinful by nature, Jesus acts as an intermediary between God and man. So as long as we believe in Jesus, we can have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Now, that's the good news. I just gave you the gospel in like three seconds. But, he, but here's what it is. Here's what I want you to get. I don't know if this thief just stumbled up on it or, or, or God revealed it to him right there on the cross. But in verse 42, he asked Jesus to be an intermediary between him and God. Oh, my God, I just realized something. He was exactly where God wanted him to be. You know what? I've said that so many times. Y'all can repeat that after me. Can y'all indulge me in a little crowd participation on the count of three? Can we say that together? One, two, three. He was exactly where God wanted him to be. Oh, it feels good. i tell you that. If I was nervous, I'm not nervous anymore. <laughs> I think it's time for me to take, take some questions. You, sir, at the back of the room. What was your question? Well, Brother Dwight, I think you're preaching mighty good now. Let me tell you something. Well, Brother, I appreciate that. Well, <laughs> let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, Brother. I got a question for you, though. If me focusing on my circumstances and pushing my expectations on God is causing me to miss out on what God is trying to do in my life, then you tell me, what in Sam Hill am I supposed to be doing? I mean, how do I fix this in my circumstance? Well, sir, I'm, let me answer your question. I was going to answer it. My answer is do what the second thief did. Uh, the second thief, you want to know the difference between the first thief and the second thief? No matter how much pain the second thief was enduring, he never asked to be delivered from his circumstance. He never asked to be delivered from his suffering. He changed his perspective and focused on Jesus. I'm telling you, when you change your perspective, and divert your, divert your focus from the situation to Jesus, the very same obstacle that you was facing could be your catalyst into a new opportunity. Did that answer your question? Now, why did I know that you was going to give me some super religious explanation that makes no practical sense? <laughs> look, look, it makes sense. I promise it makes sense. Let me give you an example. Jesus was teaching one day. And he, he drew a large crowd of 4,000 people. And the disciples wanted to be good hosts. They came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we have an issue. All these people have been following us and, and they're hungry, but we don't have enough food to feed them. Well, Jesus said, what do you have? And their reply was, all we have is five loaves and two fishes. I want you to notice their perspective. They saw the five loaves and two fishes as a limitation. Jesus says, well, give it here. He prays over it, he breaks it, and he begins distributing it. And by the time he gets done distributing it, all 4,000 people ate Captain D's that day. And get this, there were leftovers. That sounds like my kind of party. I love some leftovers. Well, I want you to notice that Jesus took what they saw as a limitation, and he made it into the very solution to that situation. So let me say it again. When you change your perspective and you divert your focus from the situation to Jesus, the very same obstacle that you're facing could be a, your catalyst into a new opportunity. What does that look like? Well, you know what? Instead of, instead of complaining about all the time you had to spend isolated in, in, during the COVID pandemic, how about be thankful for all the uninterrupted time that you got to spend with your family and loved ones? You know what, instead of complaining about how horrible your job is, how much they work you, how about be appreciative that you have a job and you're not one of the 30 million people who are unemployed today. 
And you know what? Instead of going on the news looking for things to have anxiety about and, and, and be worried about, how about just chill out and be thankful that you and your family are still in good health? And you know what? I know it is ve- it's not fun homeschooling. <laughs> My wife has been there. And it's not, it's not a good thing that the kids have gotten an extended summer break. And I know you're prob- probably ready to kill them before COVID can get to them. But maybe this is a perfect opportunity for you to instill some Christian values in them that they wouldn't get at school. And you know what? Instead of going on social media to voice your opinion about the division that we see in this country, the division that we see in, in our society, the division that we see in our culture, how about be more intentional about showing someone else love who doesn't look like us, who comes from a different background, who comes from a different culture? Because hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Don't focus on the situation. Get a new perspective by focusing on Jesus. Amen? I want to show you that there's some direction in how this thief got saved. So if there's anybody out there who's not saved, anybody in the audience, and since we're all Bible thumpers here, I know we're all saved. If there's anybody online or or watching on social media who's not saved, I want you to do what this thief did. And because I realize that there's no limitations on the Holy Spirit, so it doesn't matter where you're at. You can be driving to work, at home, sitting on your computer, or sitting on the toilet on your cell phone, what most mommies do in this day and age. <laughs> you, you can do what this thief did, and you can experience God's grace, God's salvation, and the forgiveness of your sins. This thief did three things. Number one, he believed. He believed that Jesus was the Christ, and he was the only one that could save him. In church, we call that faith. Faith is a religious word that simply means to put your trust in Christ and his ability to save. Number two, he confessed. And confess simply means to admit that you've done something wrong. When this thief was in the presence of Jesus, he seen his own sin. That's why he fessed up to his mistakes. He owned up to his mistakes. Something similar happens in Isaiah 6 and 5. When Isaiah encounters God, he says, Woe unto me, I am a man with unclean lips. When we're in the presence of God, we see our own mistakes. So since God sees all and he knows all, sometimes it's just good to release those transgressions by confessing them. Number three, he repented. He repented. The purest definition of repentance simply means to make a U-turn. This thief, got on the cross, a criminal headed to hell. But he changed direction, and he literally made a U-turn to heaven. So he, com- he believed, he confessed, and he repented. He believed, he confessed, and he repented. He believed, he confessed, and he repented. And if you want to be saved today, that's all you have to do. Believe, confess, and repent. Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you too shall be saved. I want to bring your attention to verse 43 in my closing. Because after the thief, after the thief asked Jesus to remember him, when he gets to his kingdom, Jesus says something very profound. In verse 43, Jesus starts off with the phrase, Truly, I tell you. Now, the, now, theologians say that Jesus has used this phrase over 77 times in the New Testament. But I want to tell you, when Jesus says, truly, I tell you, it means that he is about to say something totally life-changing. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. He says, today. Not tomorrow, but today, 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 you will be with me in paradise. You know what I wonder as I'm preaching to you? You know what I wonder as I was preparing this sermon and as as I was praying and as I go through my own life? I was wondering 
What does each and every one of you today look like? Today, did you wake up worried about your financial future? Today, have you seen so many horrible things in the news that you're unsure of the time frame that we're living in? Today, are you so worried about your health or contracting COVID or any of these viruses that you're just too terrified to come out the house? Today, are you dealing with loneliness and depression that you're too proud to reach out to anyone? Today, are you still holding grudges against people who've already moved on in life? Today, have you given up on your dreams or, or pursuing things you're passionate about? Today, are you mourning the loss of somebody or something that's left a feeling of emptiness in the pit of your stomach? Well, if that's your today, I want to share with you the good news. Jesus said today, you will be with him in paradise. Do y'all know what that means? The word used for paradise is a Persian word. It means walled gardens. And in those times, if the Persian king let you walk with him through his garden, that meant that you was a friend of the king and you had a relationship with the king. Jesus was saying to this thief, today we're going to enter in a relationship. And from here on out, you're going to be at peace with God. So I want you to know if you're saved, if you have a relationship with God, then today you don't have to worry about your financial future. Today you can, give, you can give up and release all worry and anxiety and stress. Today you can leave your health in the hands of a loving and just God. Today you can forgive those people who've wronged on you and release the bitter that you're harboring in your heart because God forgave you. Today you don't have to give up on your dreams. Today you can rest in assurance and knowing that you will see your loved ones again one day. If you truly are a child of the king, if you've been saved, then newsflash, dummy, you win. <laughs> because of what he did on the cross, he has given us the victory over life and death. Amen. I want to invite you all today Anybody who wants to give their life to Christ today. But let me rephrase that. Anybody who wants to give their will, their perspective, their agenda, who you see yourself as, if you want to give that to Christ today, if maybe you're not saved today, maybe you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you are saved, and yet you've been going down the wrong path. You've been distracted. You've been focused on everything else but Jesus. If that's you today, we have Steve, Angie, and Daniel in the back, Pastor Daniel with the bald head. He would love to pray with you. As I go to my seat and they sing this song, I, wanna ask, I want you to ask yourself a question today. Is my perspective Christ? Amen. Stand and worship together.
about a big thank you to our praise team for leading us in worship today. Technically, I'm still on vacation, so Daniel drafted me to come up here today, but it's absolutely appropriate. Number one, I'd like to say happy 28th anniversary yesterday to my lovely wife, who has stuck with me all these years. Thank you for loving me and being, uh, she, she married into the ministry, and uh, that was a, that's a heaping handful in addition to me being a heaping handful. I want to say a big thank you to Daniel, who uh, really covered for me all week. I left town, and I left a mess behind me, and he has worked all week long. The lights went out on main campus in Goodlesville. We had to have a whole team to come in and fix the whole lighting system. And uh, how about, and he preached last night and today in Goodlesville. Totally different message from Dwight's. He did a great job. How about a big thank you to Daniel for all he does. <laughs> and uh, I cannot say enough about, uh, about Dwight. Uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't sit back today and evaluate. I just sat back and enjoyed and let God speak to me through Dwight. I know how hard he's been working on this message, but I got to tell you, he is a gifted. Can you tell he's called by God to be a, a pastor? And Dwight, that was a wonderful message. I love you, brother. I love you as a brother in Christ. I'm very proud of you. A wonderful, incredible message. I encourage you to go home and share that with people. Because how many times do we miss what Christ is really doing because we're trying to get him to do what we want him to do? How little to get down off the cross, how big to live forever in paradise with God. And that's where we oftentimes try to put God. Don't let your little perspective keep, keep you from having the great glory that God's doing. Hey, to this, past, this past weekend, today, we had three different guys from our church not called Pastor Tim preaching. Isn't that awesome? We had one in Gallatin, one in Goodisville, and one at Mount Denson. Uh, here in two weeks, Adam's going to be preaching up in Springfield at Mount Denson. He is a fantastic preacher, and we can't wait for him to preach for you here as well. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be a part of a church that is working hard to raise up these young ladies, these gentlemen, and I think God deserves a hand clap of praise for what he's doing. <laughs> Dwight, I want you to go by the door. I want you to... I want you to uh, Get your hand sanitized, all right? Uh, some people have asked me to make you put on a mask. I don't know if that's because they need you to cover up or what. But I want you to go stand by the door, and I want everybody to love on him today and let him know how much you appreciate him, okay? And so would you join me as we pray together? Father, help us not to miss the big things because we're so focused on the little. Help us not to put Jesus Christ into a box and try to make him our genie whenever he's given so much more. Father, if we live to be a hundred and we're wealthy and we're popular and we walk in health all the days of our life, but we die, we have gained the whole world, but we've lost our soul. But thanks be to Jesus Christ, who, though we might gain the whole world, we don't have to lose our souls because we can be with you forever through what he's done. May we always have that undergirding everything that we think, everything that we say, and everything that we do. Father, may it be the first thing on our minds when we wake up in the morning. I'm going to heaven. It may be the last thing on our minds when we go to bed at night. I'm going to heaven. Thank you for this good message preached today and for this good weekend. We ask that you bless it now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.